Well, hello everyone. This is Anne Ray coming to you live from San Francisco, California on a not so sunny Saturday. And I want to welcome you to this uh, Making Art, Making Money live training series. This is actually part of the Making Art, Making Money semester, which you can find out more about at makingartmakingmoney.com. It's a little bit early. We're actually going to start the training at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time on the dot. I like to just come a few minutes early and give you an opportunity to ask any specific questions that you might have about selling your art. So um, feel free to you notice the chat box. You can type your question in the chat. And let me know what it is. We're going to be talking about pricing art today, but we don't have to. We're not going to limit questions to only pricing art because I know artists have more questions than that. It's often the first question. It's not always the only question. That's for sure. So let me know that you can actually hear me. I can see we've got people from all over the world joining in. Laura, Hedda, Mary, uh, Beth, Anita, Rita. Uh, Detrion, is that how you say your name? Sasha, Promi, Clara, Susan, Irina, uh, uh, Lucille, Kelly. I mean, there's a bunch of you. So where are you sitting on the globe? Chat and type in the chat box. Let me know what kind of art you make, where you are sitting on the globe. I'm in San Francisco, California, but I know we've got people from all over the world. And it'd be great to know where you're coming in from. And maybe just to also share... What are your top challenges right now when it comes to selling your art? What are you what are you puzzled with the most? What is what is confusing you the most when it comes to selling your art? What's a burning question? What are you most frustrated with? It's an opportunity to go ahead and um, share that because I might be able to shed some light on it. The more specific your question, the better. So we have Susan from Long Island. Oh, cool. We just actually enrolled somebody from Brooklyn in the Making Art, Making Money semester, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so in case you're wondering who this furry friend is, this is my puppy. Her name is Rebel. She'll be joining us. I can't leave her alone for the time that I uh, do the training or she'll get into all sorts of shenanigans. So she has to, she has to join us. So we have uh, Rita from Dallas. I think that might be Rita who's enrolled in the market, Making Art Making Money semester. One of my students, I'm not sure. Who else? I have my glasses on. We got Tracy from American Canyon, which is the San Francisco Bay Area. Cool. Emmanuel, hello. Hello, Emmanuel. Where are you, where are you chiming in from? Curious to know. Um, and I also like to know how people found me. Now, some of, a number of people who are here are actually already enrolled in the Making Art, Making Money semester, but some of you may have come by way of the invitation, free invitation that I sent out um, as part of the um, offering my guide. And we have Jim. All right, cool. So we've got it's uh, 12.56, 12.57, so in three minutes we're going to start the training and I'm going to be sharing my screen with you. Um, you should have received a follow-along guide, a PDF, a link to a PDF. If you haven't printed that out already, I would take this time to do that so that you've got it handy. It's going to help you focus during the training. You're going to learn more and you're going to retain more by using that. All right, we got uh, Manuel says... Please, will this webinar be a playback on YouTube? So if you registered for this webinar, uh, there will be a playback. Yes. Uh, not forever. Um, only for people who are registered. It's not, these webinars are not, um, I don't just put these on YouTube and make them available to everyone, because this is actually part of the Making Art and Making Money semester training. I And this is really just a thin slice of the Making Art, Making Money semester. These live webinars are very thin slice. I just decided to make this available to anybody who wants to learn about selling their art and who's willing to um, positively contribute to the conversation here. Anybody in that category is welcome to, if you want to learn, I'm happy to teach you. Got Caroline from Oregon. Hey, Caroline, I've actually worked, I partner with a number of small business development centers. 
um, in Oregon, which I recommend. Um, Dana from Oklahoma. Okay, cool. We got a lot of people from all over the place here. Got a lot of you tuning in. We already have we have 120 attendees already, and we haven't even started. That's pretty cool. All right. So um, again, some of you are asking about watching the replay of this. If you're registered, you'll receive a link. Um, but if you're here right now, you'll receive a link. But no, you can't go to YouTube and see this. This is not available for that. Sebastian from London. Hey, Sebastian. I am a UK citizen. So I have dual citizenship of the United Kingdom and United States. So hello. Actually, here's my tea, Sebastian. <laughs> it's got milk in it. <laughs> That's not the way a lot of Americans drink their tea, by the way. They usually drink it straight up. Um, we've got uh, ah, Emmanuel from Nigeria. How cool is that? All right, we've got um, Val Heda from Valentine, uh, Nebraska. Cool. I think I have a partnership in Nebraska. Sebastian said that is the proper way to drink tea. That's right. And you have to drink it really hot. Otherwise, it's referred to as water bewitched if it, the tea water is cold. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start the training because it's 1 o'clock and we're going to start on time. I'm going to share my screen with you. And then I'll be popping back in. And you can, um, you can actually continue to go ahead and uh, check. Put your questions in the chat box because I will be checking them. I will be popping back in. Today's topic is about pricing your art. This is a big question that a lot of people have. Um, how do you price your art? Are you asking you? you know, artists are always concerned if they're asking too little or if they're asking not enough. So we're gonna hopefully get to um, answer some of these questions for you. Now, if you haven't already, I have put a link in the chat box to the PDF follow along guide. It's really important to print that out because it's gonna help you focus. And um, I always like to know what type of art you make. So if you, um, you know, I'd love to share, if you can share what type of art you make or what your top challenges are, it's really important, it helps me. Also, if you wanna, post the link I just put in the chat box. This is the registration link to these trainings. So if anybody wants to learn, go ahead and put it on your Facebook group and uh, go ahead and um, you can put it on your Facebook group. You can put it on, um, uh, you can put it in, you can email it to anybody who you think, you know, would benefit from learning. Again, if you're, if you're interested in learning about selling your art without feeling like a sellout and um, you're interested in learning how to become an independent artist um, and you're tired of submitting to the art establishment, this is the place. And again, if you're willing to learn and you're interested in positively uh, contributing to the conversation, you're welcome. Again, uh, for those of you who just joined us, this is actually part of the Making Art, Making Money semester. And I just decided to open up this, this is a thin sliver. These live, this live training and others are actually a thin sliver of the Making Art, Making Money semester. Um, if you wanna learn more about the Making Art, Making Money semester, you can actually go to the page that I just put in the chat and you can also apply there. Uh, some of you may be here because I partner with a number of small business development centers, and arts councils and independent uh, nonprofit or nonprofit arts organizations. If you belong to an organization, a nonprofit organization that serves artists, and you're interested in helping that group of artists thrive, you can make this free business training available to them by applying. It is available by application only. You go to makingartmakingmoney.com, page down to the very bottom, and you'll see a link to an application page for this free business training program for artists. Now, I do only work with organizations who care about helping artists make money with their art, and they're not always that concerned. So that is the major criteria. 
So some of you know who I am, but some of you don't. My name is Ann Ray. My last name is Ray. I was mentored by Wayne Tebow, Gregory Kondos, and Victor Schreckengoss. So Wayne Tebow is an American art icon, as uh, is his friend, Gregory Kondos. Victor Schreckengoss was one of the founding fathers of industrial design. He was also a noted painter, a noted Besides being an amazing industrial designer, he was a noted ceramicist and painter. And by example, he taught me a lot about business because he always maintained his patents and his trademarks. He was a very wealthy man and an incredibly powerful uh, creative powerhouse. The only reason I'm sitting here talking to you today is because the fourth week of December 2004, I decided to make a very specific goal or what's referred to as a smart goal. That goal was to sell over a hundred thousand dollars of my art during my very first year as an artist. And what did I do? I sold $103,246. So from the, for those of you who are from the United States, you might recognize this tax form that we have to complete to report our income as sole proprietors. So for those of you not from the United States, that's what this is. This is my actual tax form 2005 that shows how much um, my, my gross sales were. So I have a whole separate training on defining smarter goals and I absolutely recommend it. Um, it's an amazing, amazing, uh, important thing to know. Um, let's just see something here. Okay, I'm back you guys, I apologize. It looks like uh, we had some technical difficulties. So uh, please let me know that you can actually hear me by going into the chat. 
So I'm back. I can see that you're there. And again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. There we go. There she is. Okay, so Christine can see me. Thank you so much for your patience. I'm going to continue on with the presentation. And um, you, haven't, you haven't missed much. Okay. All right, so let's get back to the presentation. So what I was explaining, I'm going to share my screen with you now. You're going to stop seeing me, and you're going to start seeing the presentation again. Now, what I was talking about was the only reason that I'm here is because I actually created a goal to sell $100,000 of my art in 2005. And I sold $103,246 of my art. As, uh, okay, let's see. I can chat to, um, Okay, I'm not sure how to help you guys with the technical. I can't actually do give you any YouTube support, but I am here and I can hear, I can see that you are here. So if you post any technical issues, I won't actually be able to help you. Um, you you'll only be able to actually uh, just refresh your screen. Um, that's all I can, that's all I can tell you unfortunately, because I can't support YouTube. Um, so hopefully uh, you can see. So okay, your video link from the email leads to a screen that says watch this video on YouTube. All right, so some of you are able to tune in and some of you are not. Okay, so unfortunately, I'm just going to keep it moving. And um, you know, for those of you who can catch this, then fantastic. If not, I don't know what to tell you at this point. Unfortunately, I just have to keep moving for those of you who do have access. So uh, as I was saying, as a result of creating that goal, it was pretty simple. You know, then I started to receive some press attention. I was on ABC in the San Francisco Chronicle in Fortune magazine on the Good Life Project uh, with my friend Jonathan Fields on HGTV. And I'm um, just going to come back in here again just so that you can actually see my face. And I was also on Creative, I've also taught two very popular courses on Creative Live that broadcast to over 1 million students worldwide. And I was most recently featured in Art Business News in an article entitled Selling Art Sucks. And selling art does suck. I don't believe in selling art, believe it or not. I actually believe in selling, val creating value above and beyond your art and actually selling that. Okay, so let's talk about what you're going to be learning today. So if you're having technical issues, and I want to suggest that you, you, you actually can just listen in and still receive tremendous value. So if for some reason YouTube is not working for you, just listen to what I'm saying and I think you'll you'll get a lot of benefit out of it. If you uh, you can also listen to the replay. So what today's topic is about is pricing your art. This is a big burning question for artists. How do you price your art? So I'm going to see um, I'm curious if and people can chat in and let me know what you feel about pricing your art. Are you confident in the pricing that of your art? Or if you're a little, a little hesitant about what you're charging. And I'm also going to encourage everyone to turn off your phones, turn off your email, cl uh, email clients, and close your door. Do whatever you need to do to minimize your distractions. Because interruptions cost you money. Frankly, they cost you a lot of money because they cost you productivity. And that really costs your happiness and your success. So, because once you've been interrupted, the point, the problem is, is that you will actually, um, it's going to take you 23 minutes and 15 seconds to recover your full attention. That's a lot of time. That's a whole lot of time. So, and I'm going to share that statistic with you. That's a lot of time. Think about that. What if you just eliminated your interruptions for blocks of time? Let's say for an hour. 
or maybe, um, you know, three hours, maybe a half an hour, you just turned your phone off. Imagine what it would do for your productivity. So Dawn says, a gallery owner has said my art is appropriately priced, but rarely do people pay the full price during open studios, art fairs, or shows. Oh, Dawn, this is bad. I hope you're not discounting your art. Uh, I'm going to get to this, but you never, ever want to discount your art. Ever, ever, ever. You need to adjust your pricing or your offerings. Um, we're going to get to that in a bit, but please, um, please pay attention to this point. Um, again, your questions are welcome. Keep them coming in the chat box because I do review them and I try to address as many as I can during the broadcast. So here's our agenda. I'm going to talk to you very briefly about my story and the new creative class, how we're going to get into pricing your art. So I'm going to give you some action items you can complete. I'm actually going to give you some homework that you can complete. And then we're going to get to just what the mission is here, why I'm doing this anyway. And um, we're going to actually also get into a live Q&A. Now, if those of you want to hang around for the live broadcast till the end, this is not available for people who listen to the recording, but only people who are here live, I'm going to give you for free my 10-point self-evaluation guide about artists at websites that sell. This is a really fantastic way to take a look at whether or not your website is working for you or working against you. And you obviously want to make some changes if it's working against you. So here's a fundamental thing you've got to understand, really understand. You have to understand what our product is. So as artists, we own what's often referred to as a micro business. And so what's our business, right? What's our product? Well, it's not goods and it's not services. Our product is actually emotion. If you really think about this, do I sell paint that's stuck on canvas? No, I sell the emotional response that's ignited in the viewer. If someone feels it enough and they have the budget, they'll buy it, right? It's art to them, but only it's only art to them if they feel it. And that's why art is truly in the eye of the beholder. A musician doesn't sell uh, noise in the air, right? The musician sells the emotional response that is, that is shaped by the music in the listener. As artists, we sell emotion. We sell emotion. And that's really, really important to understand what your product is. So let's carry on. And I'm gonna actually ask you to listen to an interview because I want you to hear my story, not because I want you to, it's all about me, me, me. I don't really care about that. Uh, this is not an ego stroke. I'm putting a link to in the chat box to an interview that I did with Alex Bloomberg of uh, This American Life and uh, Planet Money because I want you to understand that although I've had very significant success as an independent artist, it didn't come easy to me. And that is why I share my story. So if you haven't heard my story, I'm going to recommend that you listen to it. Not because, again, I want, it's all about me. It's because I want you to, after you listen to my story, parts of it you're going to relate to, parts of it you're not going to be able to relate to. But the reason I want you to listen to it is because I want you to really get in touch with your story. What is the story you are telling yourself about being successful as an artist? Because by and large, the narrative that people are entertaining in their head about being an artist is fairly negative and, or it's unrealistic. Um, or it's just so, it's, it could be so many things, but it's important for you to understand what your story is so that you can change it if you want to because your life is the story that you're telling yourself. So let's talk about the new creative class and about the opportunities that are available to you now that were never available to you before. And this is a great opportunity. This is a fantastic opportunity to join the new creative class. But how do you do that? Well, first thing you have to do you have to make a decision. Do you want to join the new creative class or do you want to continue to submit to the art establishment? And if you want to 
uh, join the new creative class, you're going to have to question authority. That's the first thing you're going to have to do. You're going to have to question the authority that the art establishment has over you and your life and your business and your success as an artist, and you're going to have to question your own authority. You're basically just going to have to give yourself permission to sell your art. And you're not, and, and you're not going to, without needing someone's permission, without needing someone's sanction, without needing, a, a, you know, some accolade, you just go do it, right? You take back your power. That's what I did. I actually fired all the galleries and art representatives that I work with, and then I made $103,000, $103,000 of my art during my first year. So a lot of people don't know that. I actually fired them all. And frankly, um, it's because of the reasons I'm going to get into right now. Why did I fire my art representatives? People, you know, work long and hard to find representation. And we want to know why I went, when I went and fired them, and I'm going to tell you the difference. Because members of the new creative class, or the option that I found was I was more I was more concerned with creating my customer satisfaction and selling my art than competing with for permission um, from the art establishment with competing with all these other artists to just for to show my art and hoping that it would sell. I decided to make a goal and a plan instead of hope. Okay, hope doesn't get you, I mean, hope is good, you have to have hope, but hope alone is no good. You know, it's gotta be followed by an, an, a target, an aim, and some action. And I was just tired of competing with other artists. I didn't feel, I respected other artists. There was talent that was better than mine, different than mine. I didn't wanna compete with other artists. I wanted to compete for the attention of patrons, of collectors, so that's the major difference right there. And then the other reason I fired my representatives, and I'm, by the way, I'm not suggesting that you just fire representatives. I'm just telling you what I did. All right, if you've got representatives who are selling your art, don't fire them. Uh, if you've got good relationships, keep them. I'm just sharing my experience, and I'm sharing the difference between the two choices that are available to us. Members of the new creative class are basically your sales are only ever going to be limited by your marketing sales efforts and expertise and that's one of the things you're starting to gain with this kind of training you're trying to you're starting to gain expertise and this is not expertise you're going to get from art school or from business school and i can say that with authority because my brother was the form is the former dean of a business school and he didn't know any of this stuff um with the art establishment, your sales are always going to be limited by your representation. That's if you can get representation and that's if you can keep it. Now, the thing of it is, is that even artists who are quote unquote successful within the art establishment aren't making a whole lot of money. And I know that because a number of them are my students in the Making Art, Making Money semester. They have representation, which from the outside looks really good, but when you get down to dollars and cents, they're barely scraping by. The other, the other, the other, uh, issue with banking on the art establishment is that since the recession in 2008, the word on the street is over half of the art galleries, at least within the United States, have closed their doors. The model is changing. The model's broken. Here's the new, here's the, the wonderful thing is, and this has always been true throughout history. People want to buy directly from the artist. They want a relationship with the artist. That has always been the case. Having this cold, chilly, stuffy middleman um, has never been popular. Now, I'm not talking about collecting blue chip art pieces. I'm talking about the art establishment in relation to and ship to emerging artists. I'm talking about artists who just want to make art they're proud of and make a decent living. I'm not talking about uh, trading on the secondary art market here. So please don't get confused. And a lot of art gallery owners, I mean, freaking hate my guts because of the things I'm saying. Um, and they have, but you know, here, yet I hear the whole story, right? Here, people tune into just the little piece they want to hear and then they just, you know, lose it. I'm not talking about the secondary art market, right? I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about people who just want to make a damn living with their art, right? Simple, very, very simple. And those are the members of the new creative class. Here's the other thing. When you have, when you're a member of the creative class, you have a specific goal, like the one I shared with you, and you take focused action towards it. That 
earns you self-confidence. But every time you seek permission and you get rejected from the art establishment, your self-confidence erodes. So when I survey artists and I ask them what their top two challenges are when it comes to selling their art, self-confidence comes up as one of the top two. And it's no big surprise if anyone who faces that much rejection and has feels like they have no power over their success or their future, they're going to start to lose self-confidence. Here's another big difference. Members of the new creative class always get paid 100% up front, and you never discount your art. So there's somebody in the chat earlier was implied that she was discounting. Please do not discount your art. It's very detrimental. You're con the, you as an artist or a craftsperson, a maker, you're in the luxury retail business. Okay, that's the business your micro business is engaged in. And in luxury marketing, as soon as you discount a product or a service, you basically shot yourself in the foot. So you wanna maintain a very clear pricing strategy that gives people price options, but not discounts, ever. Problem with the art establishment is that they will often, you know, you get paid half, if that, later, and they often will discount your work in order to close the sale. That's a big problem. When I did work with representative in Los Angeles, I did not allow her to discount any of my art. And she told me that artists who maintain the no discount policy always made significantly more sales than those who did not. So for what it's worth, those are the reasons why you never want to discount your art. Members of the new creative class make art that's inspired by a personal mission that serves a target market. When I say personal, personal mission, that means that they create art that's in that's in full in, in full integrity for who they are and what they stand for and what they stand against. So a lot of people have this notion that you're going to have to sell out and actually the opposite is true. The artists who have done well throughout history know who they are and what they stand for and they don't compromise. So that's a characteristic of the new creative class. But artists who are submitting to the art establishment are basically making art for art's sake, largely for their own entertainment, and so they're subject to rejection from fickle critics. So you can make art for your own entertainment, for your own um, creative interest, or you can make art that's inspired by a mission. I prefer to make art that's inspired by a very clear mission in service to other people, because I think that makes for a better life, and it also makes for better sales. So members of the new creative class deliver value above and beyond their art. Remember, I don't believe in selling art for art's sake. It sucks, it doesn't work, it's very difficult. I believe that you've gotta create value above and beyond the art itself. In fact, every single artist in history created, living and dead, has created art above and beyond the art itself in service to a target market. So this is not a new thesis here. If you're wondering what I mean by, you know, creating value above and beyond your art. I just put a link in the chat box that will take you to six very clear examples of emerging artists just like you and how they've created value above and beyond their art. When you submit to the art establishment, the value you're offering is very vague. And you can tell it's vague because you just have to read an artist statement. Artist statements are the most vague, self-involved, tedious things I've ever read. I freaking hate them. They are just as painful to read as they are to write. And I challenge any artist to send me an artist statement that actually informs me about why the hell I should buy your art or even be interested in looking at it. I have yet to see one. They're horrible. And we all know it. But we all we do them anyway, right? We just keep doing it. Well, I don't do that. I have I don't have an artist statement. And I don't suggest I suggest that you rethink that whole strategy. Now, if you submit to the art establishment, they're going to make you write one of those horrible things. But uh, trust me, collectors don't read them. And if you, uh, they're, they're just, they're, again, I'm, I'm open to reading one that doesn't make me cringe, but I haven't yet. All right. So if you're a member of the new creative class, you can earn a master's of fine art if you want to. Uh, you don't have to. If you want to submit to the art establishment, you're going to need one of the M an MFA from one of the very top art and design schools. That's if you can get in, and that's if you can afford it because it 
I think the, the average tuition is around $51,000 a year, at least for the top 42 art and design schools in North America. Obviously, the barriers to entry to the art market now are little to none in the new creative class, right? We don't, we don't, we don't, we can go around the gatekeepers. Uh, the important point to remember, though, is you have to differentiate yourself, right? How do you differentiate yourself? The way you do that is by creating value above and beyond your art. With the art establishment, the barriers of entry are huge. It's like, it's just enormous. If you can possibly get representation, the key is can you even keep it? Because eventually you will fall out of favor. Someone whose art is more marketable uh, than your art will displace your inventory. And it doesn't mean that you're not good, it just means that it's just better for the gallerist. So you can't blame them. They're in business uh, to make money, and so they're gonna sell the art that actually sells. Uh, members of the new creative class own their own platform and they connect directly to their own fans. This is really, really important because when you submit to the art establishment, you don't know who bought your art, even though they're legally required to tell you who bought your art and give you the contact information. I don't, they don't. And if you ask about it, you'll be dropped from representation from most galleries. Why this is so, so important is because when you own a micro business, over 85% of your sales come by way of referrals. So if you're not getting any referrals, if you can't access those referrals, that's a lot of money. Over 85% of your potential business is being lost because you don't know who bought your art and you can't maintain a relationship with them and gain referrals from them. So it's very limiting to take the path of submitting to the art establishment. You guys got to know what you're getting into and make a choice. Bottom line is this, you have to decide if you want to build your own artistic enterprise or if you want to build somebody else's artistic enterprise. I was frankly sick and tired of building other people's artistic enterprise because I wanted to make enough money to live off of. And I wanted that relationship with my collectors. It's very rewarding to hear how my art inspires them, to share what inspired it, and to actually, you know, just, I've, I've formed friendships um, from selling art and doing commissions and people who I really care about and who care about me. And if I continued to work with the art establishment, that would never been available to me. So those are the two choices that you have, and you do need to pick a lane. You can't drive down a lane going north and south at the same time. You have to pick a lane. If you don't pick a lane, you're gonna spin out. If you try to drive north and south at the same time, you're going to spin out. It's really, really important to know that you have a choice, but to make a choice, all right? All right, so let's continue on with the presentation. Can you tell I care about this? I do care about this. I really just want artists to know that they have this available to them. Now, according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics of the United States, there are very few artists who are actually employed. There are no jobs for artists. So if there are no jobs for artists, there are no careers, you're never gonna have an art career, right? But artists, if you look at their websites, they're they're trying to, it's like they're interviewing for a job because they got their resume. You, you're not gonna have an art career. It's not possible. This is where your parents were right. You're not gonna get a job as an artist. But you could have a micro business, which is what I referred to earlier. And that's what I have. I have a micro business. So here's a hint. If you've got your resume on your website, you're acting like you have a career and you're not acting like you have a business. And um, you think about it, if you walked into a beautiful boutique and the owner came and handed you the resume, you'd be confused. You'd be like, what the hell are you doing? I'm interested in this vase or this pair of shoes or this lovely dress. Um, I don't need to see your resume. Tell me, you know, I need to see the dress. I'd, like I'd like to try it on. I'd like to see the dressing room. So, um, it's very confusing. That goes back to that 10 point evaluation guide that I will be giving to those of you who stay till the end. Uh, resumes are only for when you're submitting to the art establishment. They're very confusing to consumers in a luxury retail space. Okay, very, very confusing. And a confused mind says no. 
All right, let's get into how you price your art. Now, obviously, I'm gonna give you some, I have to give you some general principles about pricing your art because every single person here is different. But let's get into some of the things that you need to know about pricing. You gotta organize your prices logically. This might seem obvious, but unfortunately, it's not. First of all, I would recommend that you don't talk about pricing, that you have a price sheet available if you're in person uh, and you hand it to people and it should be logical and it shouldn't be something for you know a few dollars and then something for many thousands of dollars. That's essentially what I mean when I say it should be logical. If you go, if you open a menu to a restaurant, right, you can see that there is a reasonable range to the appetizers and a reasonable range to the main courses. There aren't huge jumps in prices. If you'll notice on a menu in a restaurant, we start with the appetizers, which are of lower price, and then you go into the main courses. So you have to ask yourself or, in, or ask other people, show them your pricing, and ask them if it seems to be logically organized, and start surveying people. There's your first piece of homework. Start surveying people and ask them if it seems to make sense or if the prices seem illogical, because if there's any disconnect or impression of it being illogical, a conf you'll confuse someone. A confused mind says, what do they say? A confused mind says no. So that's important. And I'll use the menu analogy to, um, you know, you group things on a menu, right? There's appetizer, main courses, beverages, wine list. Things are grouped and they're very logically presented. Same thing with you when you organize, when you present your prices on your website. Now, this is going to depend on you and your offerings, but if you can, I would narrow your price points down to no more than three. Why? Because a confused mind says no. Think of small, medium, and large, right? This also goes back to that discounting issue we were talking about earlier. I would rather you have a lower offering price point to point someone to than to discount something, right? So if this, if you, so this is important. If you, and you can only figure out what price points to offer by looking at historical data. So you've got to look at all of the all of the items that you have sold so far and figure out what's the median price, what's the average price point that people seem to buy your work. And then I stick that medium, that median price in the middle. So that's what I would recommend you do. So you narrow it down to three, if you can, a small, medium, and large. Here's the thing about prices, you guys. They're just like art. They're made up. They're literally made up. So you can make them up. Now you want to make sure whatever price you, you have to know all of your costs, right? You have to absolutely understand all of your costs because if your price don't cover your costs and, and yield you a profit, then there's no point in putting a price tag on any of it, really, because you don't want to lose money. Uh, so I wouldn't offer it for sale. If you can't, if you can't make money from the art that you're making, whether it's a pair of earrings or a painting or woodworking or whatever it is that you do, there's no point in putting a price on it. Until And so what you need to do there is you actually need to learn more about sales and marketing. We've covered this one, but I can't emphasize it enough because people literally kill their reputations and their brands by discounting. Whatever you do, do not discount ever. Lose the sale, all right? Here's the thing. Remember, we're in the luxury retail business, and every time you discount, you ruin your reputation. So during the most, I am actually a student of the luxury market. I was very active in the Luxury Marketing Council of San Francisco during the recession. And we noticed that we had experts coming in for all the time, giving us data on marketing and trends and luxury. And without fail, those brands that maintained their prices and did not discount, they gained tremendous market share. 
as a result of maintaining their pricing. Those brands that discounted lost huge amounts of market share. So they were penny wise and pound, and pound foolish. Really, really important. Have some, just understand what people are, you know, what people have historically purchased from you in the past. Understand what your baseline is and build from that. Okay. All right. And I just actually, so examine your sales history. So there's another piece. This is the piece of homework I give you. If you haven't done this, it's a critical that you do it, that you figure out how much you've sold your art for in the past, because that's a reasonable basis, right? That's a great starting place. And again, bef uh, before, uh, before you build any pricing, price sheets or put any prices on anything, you have to know what it's costing you to actually make a piece. Make it clean and simple. I'm gonna go back to this again and again. A confused mind says no. A confused mind says no. So your price menu, your price sheet, wherever your prices are, clean and simple. Very, very important. Because if uh, a lot of a lot of artists are confused about their prices, they're not confident about their prices, so they make some pretty screwy presentations about their prices. So just make sure yours is clean and simple. All right. Um, Augustine asks, "What if we have never sold art?" Well, if you've never sold art, um, you obviously have no sales history. So. Um, my, my question for you is, has anyone expressed interest in selling your art? And if not, then you need to learn about sales and marketing, and you need to learn how to cr crack the four-part code and create value above and beyond your art so that you can sell your art. So that's a whole other subject. Still can benefit from this training, though, because when you do come to sell your art, you'll have a much better uh, baseline to go off of. So you want to list your price by the most popular item, which is you want to you know visually emphasize the most popular item. It could be the size of the item. It could be the type of the item. Um, you know, art is a pretty broad subject, right? We're talking about people who are jewelry designers, people who are printmakers, people who are glass blowers. So um, this is all what is relevant to your inventory. You have to determine um, what is most popular. And if you've never sold art before or if you've only sold a bit, okay, well, you know, everyone starts somewhere. There was a point where I had never sold a piece of art before in my life. I'd sold some I'd actually sold some um, architectural illustrations when I was in art school and some graphic design was when I was in art school, but I didn't paint or draw anything for over 10 years. I quit. I gave up on art. And so I had to come back to a place where I hadn't sold any, I had never sold any fine art. So I, um, you know, you start where you are. You start where you are. Don't worry about it. Um, Take this in from where you are right now is if you haven't sold art or if you haven't sold much art, you're learning about pricing right now. And you'll apply this later on. So you have to subtract. So when you have your retail price, you obviously you've got to subtract that cost of goods sold. What did it cost you to actually make this piece of art? It's really, really important to know. You have to also know what your daily overhead is. Some of you don't have much overhead. Maybe you paint in your bedroom or in the basement, but some of you might have a glass blowing studio where you have to keep a furnace burning. You have a significant overhead. I just interviewed a sculptor who, a um, very well famous sculptor in New York City who does um, cast bronze uh, figurative sculpture. His overhead is enormous. It's very important for him to track what his overhead is very carefully so that he prices things so that he makes a profit. Also, when you, once you've subtracted your overhead, you have to figure out what do you what's left over? How much how much time did you spend, right? So you take what's left over and how much time did you spend to make that art? And you know, would divide that by the hours it took you and now you've got your pay. And you can see if you're paying yourself even minimum wage. That's important. The time you invest, 
is important to understand because you only have so much time. There are only 24 hours in a day. You can get more money. You can buy more supplies, but you can't buy more time. So it's critically important for you to get a rough idea of how much you're actually paying yourself at the end of this equation. So again, the retail price minus the cost of goods sold minus the daily overhead, right? How much does it cost? So let's just say it's the retail price of something that takes you one day to make, right? Cost of subtract the cost of goods sold, subtract how much, maybe it's a day of overhead, maybe it's more. What's left over? You paying yourself minimum wage? Do you have a profit or not? Now here's some other things that are really important to consider when you're pricing. Unlike other businesses, let's say if you were a plumber or a landscaper or an auto mechanic, you're not basing your pricing on self-worth, right? A lot of artists are basing their pricing, their idea of self-worth. They're not really doing an appraisal. What you got to do is you actually have to do an appraisal, just like, in, just like when you're selling real estate. You have to go and look at similar works and quality and experience and see what they're selling for. It's not doesn't mean that you copy their prices, but you want to get a sense of what is a reasonable range for you to price your work and not base it on your ideas of self-worth or your level of self-confidence because that's not a basis for pricing. That's a very irrational way to price your art. Already covered this, but I'm gonna cover it again and again. Are you discounting your art? If you're discounting your art, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You gotta stop doing that. You really have to stop doing that. And are you giving your art away for free? I'm leaving you, uh, this part of the presentation on this note because it's so very important. Let me just tell you something about giving your art away for free. Don't ever give your art away for free to anyone, for friends, to family, to a good cause, because if you do that, you are shooting yourself in the foot. Um, I, when I did work with galleries, the gallery owner, the first thing she asked me, and I completely appreciate why she asked me this question, she asked, had I been giving my art away for free? And if I had answered yes, she would have not represented me. And I said no, because I knew better. And she said good. And she said because if you would have answered yes, I would not represent you. Because there's no sense in me trying to build a market for, my, for our, an artist's work if they're gonna undermine its value by giving it away for free. So let me say that again. Don't give, the, don't give inventory away for free to one group of people and then ask another group of people to pay you for it. You First of all, it's fundamentally unfair, number one. It's bad business, number two. And number three, you're going to struggle with an internal conflict. And you're going to have, you're going to have conflict asking this group for money when you gave this group the uh, art for free. Okay? Uh, all right, Sebastian, you must have been listening. It says, so did you have a representation? Sebastian, as I explained, I fired all my representation. <laughs> no, I did not. Um, I do not anymore. That's what the whole creative class is about. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to carry on with a, another presentation, another part of the presentation, keep it moving. Um... All right, so I will be sharing this guide at the end of the presentation, but I want to talk to you really about the real reason why a lot of artists struggle to sell their art. There actually is a reason why artists struggle to sell their art. It's not because art is not selling. So a lot of artists will say, oh, people are just are not buying art anymore. That's actually not true. So here's the thing, people are entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. The fact is, is that over $59 billion worth of art sold online alone last year. That's according to a New York Times article published March 20th, 2015. Also, another fact is that during the most recent recession, as I explained earlier, I'm a student of the luxury market, and every single category of luxury tanked went declined really horribly during the most recent recession. 
what category of luxury actually went through the roof, skyrocketed, you guessed it, fine art. Now a lot of that was the increase in trading blue chip art on the secondary art market. But if you were smart, if you were a member of the new creative class, you benefited from the increase in the market as an emerging artist. So the fact is, it's not that people aren't buying art. They are buying art. The reason why artists are struggling is that they're hoping to be successful instead of planning to be successful. Remember I showed you at the beginning of the hour how I my goal to sell over $100,000 of my art and then I built a plan to accomplish that goal. This is the reason, they're hoping versus planning. And they don't know what to focus on and they don't know when to focus on. And you know, frankly, neither did I. I did not know either. I was very confused. I didn't know where to start. And I would say that's probably one of the big questions that I get. If you're gonna build a, fine, a creative enterprise, where do you even start? So I'm actually gonna go over, there's actually eight realms to building a creative enterprise. I'm actually gonna go over those right now because I get this question so much. Where do I start? And I want to share with you exactly where you start because it's important for you to know. If I can find the screen, I'll show you where to start. I don't know if I can. Um, let's see. So actually, it doesn't look like I can share this, but I, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just briefly explain to you there are eight realms. There are eight separate realms, and these realms are important to understand and to follow. I'm going to start with the first four. Now, the thing of it is everything that is cre everything that's built all right, it follows a process. You would not build a home without first having a blueprint, right? You would not install a roof without first actually um, laying the foundation. And you wouldn't even lay the foundation, right, uh, until you actually positively compacted the soil, right? There's a process to everything, like baking a cake. There's a process to it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I sorry, lost sound. Well, I said something very interesting. 
Oh, thank you for hanging in there. Sorry about that. So the sounds should be back now. So what I just explained were the eight realms of building a creative enterprise, and there are eight. And what I explained was that a lot of people start in the fifth realm, but there are actually eight realms, and they're a certain sequence. If you start at number five, that's horrible, right? Because it's like, trying to frost the cake before you mix the batter and preheated the oven and so that's what a lot of artists are doing they're starting in the middle of the eight steps they usually start with their website that's the not the place you want to start that's the fifth step of eight steps so I just put a link into the chat box of what the eight steps are these are the steps you got to follow what we were talking about today was pricing where is pricing fall in these eight steps? Well, pricing is the eighth step. It's the last step. It's the actual last step. So you've got to go through all eight steps if you're going to build a creative enterprise. And this is the big question. If I want to build a creative enterprise, where do I start? So I've just put that link in the chat box and showed you that's where you start. That's exactly where you start. So I'm going to share my screen with you again. So uh, the other thing is you can't do this yourself. It's too freaking hard. It's too lonely. You actually need a community of other like-minded artists. And let's face it, a lot of artists, maybe not you guys, but when they see other artists become successful, they often get jealous because they're used to competing with one another and they don't share resources. They don't make introductions. But the fact is we don't succeed alone. You can't do it, it's too hard. And look around at the people you're hanging out with. Are they supporting you in selling your art? Do they, are they positive? Are they encouraging? Or do they make snarky remarks like starving artists and artsy fartsy and things like that? You know, you gotta be around people who support you and who have, um, you know, some positive energy. The other problem with artists who are trying to succeed is that if artists do get help, they often get the wrong help. I did this. Okay, so what do they do? They go to an art, they go to a life coach. I got nothing against life coaches. I benefited from my life coaching experience, but my life coach had never made art and sold art for full time and made a good living. Uh, I tried business consultants. I tried a very popular online business school. I tried marketing consultants. What's the problem? The problem is unless those people who you're getting help from have actually make art themselves and sold it themselves and actually made a good living themselves, they're not going to be able to help you. So a lot of artists are getting the wrong help. It's also why I partner with the Small Business Development Center. Amazing resource. Great information but they don't know this they don't understand the product the product we sell is emotion because i understood that that's really why i was able to sell my art that's why and that's why i went on to be featured in the national media because i understood these principles eight realms and i really i want for other artists what i wanted for myself I just want to make art that I felt proud of and make a good living, right? I didn't want to feel like I was selling being in a museum, having my art in a museum collection. I didn't care, and I still don't care. I just want to make art that I feel good about and make a decent living. That's it. That's what most people want. And the question is, is it easy to make art that you're proud of and make a good living? We know it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? We know it's not easy. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna BS you and say that it's easy. It's not easy. And it's particularly not easy if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and you keep hoping for another result, right? It's not going to happen. But is it possible to make art that you're proud of and make a good living? It absolutely is possible. I've done it. I've helped other artists from all around the world do it. Okay? It absolutely is possible. Now, the thing is, like I said, you're going to need expertise. And 
you're going to have to have a supportive community of like-minded artists to get this done. If you want to make a build a sustainable business, selling your art part-time or full-time, you're going to have to have this expertise and you're going to have to have support. It's too damn lonely and it's too damn hard. And you get artists who are not jealous of your success or competing with you. And that's why I developed the Making Art, Making Money semester, which this training is a thin slice of. I want to talk to you a little bit about the benefits of investing in acquiring expertise like this. First of all, it saves you time. I shared earlier, I don't know if you all caught it, but I didn't make art or any, any art at all for over 10 years. I don't even want to think about the time that I lost. Okay, I lost a lot of time because I just didn't know it was possible and I didn't know where to start and I didn't know how to do it. And when you acquire expertise, it saves you money because it costs me a lot of money trying to find the expertise. It cost me a lot of time, it cost me a lot of money. And I'd been able, had I had one of me or someone who had actually made a good living selling their art and understood these eight realms, it would have saved me a lot of money. I spent a lot of money on life coaching and business marketing consultants, and I'm not saying that they weren't at all helpful, but they didn't really give me the expertise that I needed. You avoid a lot of opportunity costs when you have access to expertise. You know, the clock's ticking, you guys. I don't know about you, but I was inspired to kick it into gear because a friend of mine, two friends of mine were diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And I realized that none of us know when our number's up. That's actually what kicked it into gear for me. And I decided to go ahead and um, go for it because I didn't want to lose the opportunity. So when you have expertise, you avoid opportunity costs. And you're far less frustrated when you have a proven roadmap. Those eight realms are a proven roadmap. They're pro I can, those, if, you, if you master each one of those realms, you'll have a sustainable creative enterprise. And you'll focus on the right things at the right time. And you're going to have a lot more self-confidence. Because when you sell your, don't sell your art, you feel like, you feel it's obviously you're unhappy. It's very depressing. These are some of the things that artists shared with me about how they feel when they are not selling their art. They feel small, insignificant, defeated, disconnected from others, anxious, depressed, bummed, doubtful, misunderstood, disrespected. But when they do sell their art, they feel happy. They feel validated, proud, empowered, respected, excited, pleased fulfilled. I mean, there's so much, it's not like selling widgets. When you sell your art, it's just a whole nother level of satisfaction when it comes to selling your art versus anything else you could possibly sell. Some of my students used to compete with other artists and they stopped. They don't compete with other artists. Now they create value above and beyond their art. Like Kate Bradley, she used to compete with other artists for to show, just to show her portrait paintings. So it, now she's on a very clear mission and she helps children feel help unconditional love and she does it in a very unique way she's doing extremely well uh, i encourage you to go to making a uh, katebradleyfineart.com and watch the video which clearly expresses who she is what she stands for and her mission um, Colleen Atara used to compete with all the artists just to show her eco art, and now she's on a very clear mission. She was just featured full cover on Real Woman magazine, which explains her mission. A lot of it was about her mission. It's amazing. Uh, Ann Vernon used to compete with all the other artists around her, showing her figurative paintings. Now she clearly creates value above and beyond her art because as a figurative artist, she is also a licensed hypnotherapist who specializes in past life regressions. She does that, she clears an emotional block in her client, and then that client often celebrates their emotional breakthrough with a portrait of themselves from the former life. I mean, that is, she's writing a book, and is doing speaking engagements. It's very clear the value she offers above and beyond her art. Uh, by the way, everybody's art even imp improves after the Making Art, Making Money semester because they're so much more inspired and motivated. 
And by the way, a lot of people ask me, do I need a body of work? You don't need a body of work to enroll in the Making Art, Making Money semester. And actually, you're almost in a better place if you don't have it. Jenny McGee used to compete with all the other artists to show her mixed media paintings. Now, she actually sits with a patron who uh, puts together a love list, the re a list of reasons why they love someone. Jenny uses that love list to inspire a mixed media painting. When that painting is unveiled, everybody starts crying. And what's amazing is really Jenny's paintings hasn't, haven't changed that much. It's just that she uses the love list to inspire a painting. And this is very grounded in who she is and who she stands for. If you learn a little bit about Jenny, Jenny was given a 50-50 chance to live. And as a result of that experience, she realized that it was really important to tell people that you love them and tell them why you love them so that they can feel it. So if you're ready to help yourself, I'm absolutely ready to help you. Um, here are some students who are enrolled in the Making Art, Making Money semester. Robin from Dallas just says, it works. It absolutely works. Irina says, thank you. Just rearranged my mind just now. Actually, I just rearranged Irina's mind again because we just did a phone consult. Pamela says that she's grateful for the semester because it's self-paced. It's entirely self-paced. So that means that um, she can live on both coasts and go at this at her pace. And she says the value has been very worth the price tag. And Brady says, be ready for whatever can happen and start learning. Uh, Lucy, I'm gonna actually, Lucy says, uh, Anne, you have such a big heart that you're able to deliver this semester to so many different artists fairly and students feel cared for and valued by you. Um, and I'll just share something else that, um, Lucy just sent this email to me, and I just want to read it to you because it's really true. She took the time to do this, and I'm very grateful for her taking the time to do this. She says, hi, Anne, I feel the real reason that some people who postpone their sign-up to the semester or not sign up is that they think they can figure it out on their own. And if they follow your free stuff, and there are tons, and the resources you recommend. But that's, and that's what I thought. And that's what Jenna, our new Australian student, who I just enrolled, and other study partners have thought. But people don't know how much more depth there is to the Making Art, Making Money semester and in what you have to offer us as a student in the semester. Your knowledge, experience, and insight is so vast and deep. Even though you're giving away so much free, there is so much more. I wish there was a way for people on the border line know that and jump in earlier rather than waiting. So this is what, what Lucy's saying is true. I do offer a ton of free resources, but it doesn't really work um, if you don't, it works if you, if you like as a hint, as a way to boost, but it doesn't, if you, if you don't really have a plan to sell your art, it's only going to help you. You're going to need the Making Art, Making Money semester to really, um, to really build it. Uh, someone's asking about the, eight steps. So I'll share that into the chat. Uh, the eight realms I've just reposted again in the chat. And what's uh, the making art making money semester includes eight classes. And each class is all of those eight realms. So all the realms are covered in the making art making money semester. Now, if you enroll today in the Making Art, Making Money semester, I will actually not only give you the guide, I will actually do the evaluation myself on your website. So um, what I'd like to do is invite you to enroll today, and I'm going to put a registration link into the chat box so that you can do that. And I'm actually going to, what I'm going to put in there is actually the FAQ, the FAQ to, uh, the FAQ to the Making Art, Making Money semester, because there's a lot of questions, and I'm happy to answer your questions. They're all pretty much spelled out in the uh, FAQ, so um, I doubt you're going to have any questions after reading the FAQ page if you really read it thoroughly, but if you do, you're welcome to email me, and I'm happy to um, 
uh, answer whatever questions you have. I want to make sure that it's a good fit. It's really important that it's a good fit because the Making Art Making Money semester is a very supportive and engaged community of artists from all around the world. So what I'm going to suggest is if you are prepared to enroll, I'm going to suggest that you set up a 10 minute application interview. Now, the reason I'm asking you to do this is because I want to make sure that you're actually a good fit for the community and that you benefit from the community. So I'm going to put a link in the chat box. One link is going to actually has the um, tuition payment options. There are two. Um, and it also has the FAQ. And if you're prepared to enroll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link in the chat box right now to set up a 10-minute application phone appointment with me. So it's just in the chat box. So there you go. Um, I do want to warn you, this open enrollment that I have is actually going to be ending. Tuition will be increasing. And my lifetime membership to the Making Art Making Money semester will be going away. So you want to be aware of that. So as I mentioned, if you are prepared to enroll, you want to go ahead and set up an application appointment right there. And um, I also want to say this. This is important. Um, I stand behind what I offer. It will work if you do the work. Uh, so I offer a 30-day no questions asked, money back guarantee. So the only risk that you really have is doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results. There's no risk in enrolling. And I literally don't ask any questions and say, why are you unenrolling? But I will say this, if you're not committed, don't enroll in my class, don't enroll in the semester if you're not fully committed. I don't want you in there. Um, if you are really ready though, then you're welcome to um, come and apply. I'm going to get, give you a word of caution. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're going to keep getting the same result. You're not going to get anywhere. You're going to continue to be frustrated. And I say this a lot because it's true. A plan to sell art without a plan is a plan to sell no art. Okay? None whatsoever. So, as I said, if you're ready to help yourself, I am ready to help you. And um, I've just put in the uh, chat box the uh, form to set up a 10-minute application appointment if you're prepared to enroll. And there's also the link to the FAQ page, which contains the tuition payment options. I'm going to put that in the chat again. Um, so, yeah. All right. Let me see. All right, so Sherry is asking about how long is each class. So Sherry, you can find those details in the FAQ page that I just put in the chat box. Um, and Susan says, I guess I should finish making my website. Actually, Susan, I wouldn't finish making your website because that's the fifth realm. And unless, unless you've mastered the first four realms, you really don't have any business working on your website. Uh, the fact is, is if you work on your website now and then you deter you, you you're and then you finally determine your business plan and your marketing plan, you're gonna have to do your website all over again. So this is part of it. It's really, really expensive to do things out of order. It's a lice it's like icing the cake before you've mixed the batter and before you've preheated the oven. Before you determine, are you making a birthday cake? Are you making a wedding cake? How many people are you going to serve? This is important for you to determine. So make sure that you follow things in the order of the eight realms and get the education and the expertise that you need. Okay. All right. So I think I've answered the questions. Um, and I will go ahead and share that 10 point evaluation guide uh, with you all for those of you who hung in. Appreciate it. There you go. It's in there. Augustine, I have a few, I have a free website that was built for employment, but now, okay, Augustine, I'm not sure I understand your question. 
Um, Alicia, I'm not sure if I have the link that gives me the cost for the course. Uh, okay, so um, I will get you that again. Um, the link to the FAQ, which includes the two tuition payment options, is coming your way. Hold on a second. I'll put it in there again. There we go. Okay. All right, everybody. So um, thanks for hanging in there throughout the technical difficulties. This is a function of YouTube which is sometimes a stable platform and sometimes not. Obviously, I don't control YouTube, so I can't really help besides suggest that you refresh your browser. But I appreciate that it's frustrating, so I apologize for that. I wish I had some control over it, but I just simply don't. I hope you learned something today. I hope that you'll do some of the homework that I suggested and that you'll take a look at your plan and um, ask yourself if you're ready to take it up a notch because people are buying art, um, but you need a plan to sell it if you're gonna be successful. I already wanna have a happy Saturday and thank you for joining me. I appreciate your time and your attention and I'll see you soon.